Hello and uh, welcome to Legal Thinking with me, uh, Ed Wooten. Um, and today we're going to be continuing our look at ESG in the uh, health and social care sector, particularly looking at how uh, care providers can navigate um, the potential challenges of ESG. Um, today we've got Rob Walton, who's a real estate partner, uh, and Carl Selby, who's a partner in our uh, tech sector. So we've already looked at what care providers can do on the external of their property to address the E or environment in ESG. So but today we're going to be looking at the internal of a property. Rob, how does sustainability and ESG fit together? Yeah, so sustainability in social care, it's basically focused on the needs of the current and the future generations trying to minimise environmental impact. So we're looking at practices that promote ecological balance, efficient resource use and, and long-term viability of care services. Obviously, we know what ESG is, the environmental, the social and governance, because we've already talked about it. But in terms of looking at the relevance to the social care sector, I think there's a few things here. They're looking at policy alignment. Um, that's with the, the UK government's looking to emphasise sustainability in social care and pushing for greener practices. You've got things like investment decisions where you've got your lenders are increasingly prioritizing the ESG factors. Then we've got community impact, um, social care for providers focusing on ESG can enhance the community trust. And then one of the most important things, of course, is uh, workforce well-being. So your employee welfare, making sure it's uh, aligned with ESG principles. Great, thank you. Uh, um, what is, in particular, what is a sustainability strategy uh, and how does that fit with the kind of internal environmental op options that people might have? Yeah, so as a starting point for a sustainability strategy, you're looking at a few things. Um, you want to start with assessing your current practices. You want to look at your existing operations, your energy use, your waste management. Then you want to go and set your goals. These need to be clear and measurable targets for reducing energy consumption, minimizing your waste and improving your social outcomes. The implement implementation plan comes next. So you develop your actual steps to achieve those goals. And then this is all wrapped up with monitoring and reporting, so you're reviewing your progress. Now, in terms of how this fits with a, the care home and their internal energy efficiency options, it can be structured uh, in sort of ways like this. You'd have your energy audits where you conduct assessments to identify areas where energy use can be re reduced, such as lighting or heating and your cooling. Then you may want to have your renewable energy sources, which we've talked about in a previous podcast, things like solar panels or the renewable energy technologies. You're upgrading your internal infrastructure, more energy efficiency appliances, um, insulation. Then we've got smart technology, uh, such as smart meters and energy management systems. Then we'll have your staff training, so you're educating your staff on the energy conservation practices and, and fostering the whole culture of sustainability, and then the waste reduction. So you want to align your sustainability strategy with an internal energy efficiency option, and then what you're aiming to do for a care home is to reduce their environmental impact and for them, lower their operational costs. Okay, so tech, what? where does that come in? So there, there's loads of ways that um, people can reduce, well, use technology to reduce energy usage, whether that's looking at things like heating technology, whether, you know, if you're using a fairly standard fossil fuel burning um, tool to heat buildings to moving to heat pumps and other more uh, energy efficient ways of doing that or even using things like the latest AI to look at energy usage and work out patterns of how best to um, keep places warm, but minimizing the amount of energy um, through to, you know, there's good old technology and insulation, um, you know, looking at more efficient ways of insulating buildings that sort of gets forgotten about when people are talking about technology. They always think about it as being the nice, shiny, computery stuff in the corner as opposed to um, the sort of hard, uh, old physical technologies that come along. Uh, but in addition to those sort of technologies, uh, Rob's already mentioned smart uh, energy and metering, but there are also smart devices and other things nowadays that will reduce electricity uh, consumption or, you know, indeed looking at, you know, your supply chain uh, and how you can reduce energy um, usage within the products uh, and goods that you use within um, the home to um, you know, service everyday needs and, and reducing the energy and carbon emissions that come from that supply chain. Um, so there's sure. a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, just yeah, I mean, you, you've, you talked about reducing kind of uh, electrical consumption. Obviously, a lot of tech uses can use a lot of electricity. So yeah. I guess reducing tech could also be of a benefit? Uh, yes, potentially. Um, I suppose uh, you could... 
uh, try and reduce the carbon emissions by reducing the amount of electricity that the technology that you're using has or moving that technology to places where it can be more energy efficient to use it. So, you know, if you've got um, computers, servers, et cetera, plugged into your building, that might not be the most efficient way of storing them there. And there's an ever greater move to the cloud. And within that, data centers that are looking at ever uh, more sophisticated ways of bringing down carbon emissions and using renewable energies to power them. Um, so that there might well be a um, several ways in which you can stop using technology or use technology in different ways um, to get benefits as well. Hmm. And moving on to kind of the, the specific legal issues around technologies, talking about the whole sector, so not necessarily just care providers, but also those who maybe are consulting with care providers and in installing new technologies, what might the legal issues be that new technologies can kind of bring up, as it were, that people might need to think about? Yeah, sure. Well, um, Rob's also mentioned at the outset that people like lenders and others are starting to look more and more at um, sustainability when they're offering loans or um, you know other investments into businesses. Um, so that might not quite sound like a legal issue, but ultimately it comes into the due diligence and um, other uh, checks that people do when they're entering into those type of transactions. So it then becomes a legal issue. So if you can get on top of them, you're going to make your life much easier in terms of getting lending and investment in. Mm -hmm. um, but also when you are um, contracting with providers who are um, either consultants who are coming in to do um, energy um, audits or um, make recommendations on what you can do to become more energy efficient, or you're um, uh, contracting with technology providers directly, you need to look at what contractual terms they're offering, um, You know what responsibility are they taking for the solution they're offering you and the energy savings that they say that will generate. Um, what happens if that doesn't quite go to plan? Um, who's liable for what under the contract? What's their you know, supplier trying to limit their liability to if it doesn't meet your expectations in terms of anticipated savings? Um, and then there's a few more sort of wider legal issues that come out of the, um, using any technology provider, certainly cloud-based ones, whether that's things like, you know, data protection, um, you know, even if it, if you are starting to look at clever technology that's starting to um, look at how people do things or, you know, in, in the setting of, say, a care home, um, the movement of people between rooms or buildings uh, and how that, uh, or even, you know, movement of people outside of the home, what data are they actually processing? What do you need to think about in terms of making sure you're compliant with data protection regulation? Um, and then through to, you know, how long is this contract going to be and uh, what do I need to do to end it if it, if it doesn't come off? So um, it's all, a lot. The, 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 yeah, <laughs> there's a lot to think about whenever you're contracting with anyone. Um, I yeah. probably would say that as a commercial lawyer, but um, you know, that you need to be comfortable that you are getting what you have been promised. Uh, and um, that if something didn't quite go to plan, you've got a sensible remedy, which you can, uh, rely on to make sure that you're not losing uh, too much out of the relationship. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Carl. Um, so I'm, I think this might be more of a question for Rob again, but what are the challenges in implementing an internal energy reduction policy? Yes, there can be quite a few challenges in this. I mean, the first one would be your initial cost. There can be quite an investment requirement. You're going to upgrade your equipment, improve your insulation, have more energy efficient systems. Um, that can be a barrier. So that may have to be phased over a period of time. The next thing you're looking at is your staff. I mean, there can be some cultural resistance. Uh, many staff can be resistant to change, especially if they're accustomed to using certain technologies and processes. Um, you need to foster a culture of sustainability at the start and provide the correct training for people to enable them to get them on board. You need to balance your care quality and efficiency. So whilst you're carrying out these any reduction efforts, you don't want to compromise the quality of care provided to residents. That can be a delicate balance when it comes in. Um, Moving on from this, you've got regulatory compliance. Now, the CQC, um, which I think actually Anna Fee has talked about in a, in a podcast, have now got the sustainability requirement. It doesn't come into effect for care homes until March 2025, but that's another factor to go and look at. 
but with energy reduction methods, you've also got health and safety regulations, um, and that can be in place when you're making physical modifications to a facility. We're looking at things like technical expertise as well. The staff may not have the technical expertise to identify the most en effective energy saving measures. So that comes down to training, um, how you get your monitoring and measurement in place, how you're going to track your progress, establishing those metrics to measure this energy consumption. Otherwise, you're not really sure if you're achieving anything for the, for the steps you're coming in. Um, there's behavioural change as well, actually, which is the ingrained habits that people have. And they could be simply things like in terms of windows and doors and, and, and walkways and just how things are done. Um, you may have to put things like reminders and incentives to go and foster these new behaviours. One problem is going to be your existing building. If you've got something brand new, it's, it's easier to go and build these things into it. But if you've got an older building, you've got structural limitations. It could be a listed building. There could be anything in place which makes these energy efficient upgrades a bit more complicated. Um, let's not forget the other stakeholders. Um, so you've got the management staff. Um, you've also got your residents and their families. So again, you've got to make sure everyone's on board with the efforts that you're putting into place. And probably the, the overall one is going to be the long-term commitment. Everyone gets very enthusiastic at the start of a project. Um, but as time goes on, it, that, that enthusiasm can wear a little bit thin. So you need to have something that, that keeps going and keep that long-term um, investment worthwhile. In there, you mentioned um, monitoring. How do you monitor the reduction policy? Yeah, so you've got several systematic approaches, really. So um, your first one would be to establish your clear metrics and your KPIs, your key performance indicators. So that's with things like your energy consumption. Um, you're going to be tracking your energy usage across different areas of the facility, like uh, things like lighting and heating and cooling. You want to go and look at your cost savings, monetary reductions in energy costs resulting from those efficiency measures. Look at your carbon footprint. You can calculate your greenhouse gas emissions related to energy use to assess your environmental impact and also your compliance metrics. So you measure uh, your adherence to relevant regulation sustainability standards. Then the next one we have is data collection and management. This is where, as we talked about before, your smart meters and your monitoring systems. Having these things in place gives you real-time data on your energy consumption and you can identify trends or any anomalies, anything which is going wrong in certain areas. And then you want some, perhaps some management, energy efficient management software. These, this can aggregate the data, can analyze patterns. Carl's already mentioned AI, something that can be brought in to go and look exactly what is happening and offer maybe solutions or recommendations. Uh, you'd want some regular audits and assessments in place. You can get external uh, people to come in to go and do this as well. Um, evaluating the effectiveness of the efficiency measures you've got in and, and seeing if there's any new opportunities. Uh, then you want your performance review as well to go and see um, how, what your progress is towards the goals and then you can adjust your strategies required. Next one would be your engagement and training, having your staff training program in place, making sure your staff are, are on board, understanding energy efficiency goals and the roles in achieving them. And then some form of feedback mechanism to that so they can put their own personal input in terms of what's happening, what works or what doesn't. Just because things a good idea on paper, in practice, how is it actually going to work? And is, and is it something that can be used and is, or is it going to actually get in the way of, of caring for the residents? We also need to have a regular report developing your uh, energy use and savings and then communication with your stakeholders regarding these reports to see what is happening. Align it all together with your overall ESG policy because you've got your environmental monitoring, looking at your, as we just said, the energy reduction efforts. Combine it with your social considerations, how it's impacting the quality of care and staff well-being. Make sure it doesn't compromise your care standards. And then connect it to your governance framework, which is the structures to oversee those energy efficient initiatives. It's all about continuous improvement. You want to be benchmarking things, your energy performance against industry standards or for similar facilities. One of these things you can be doing if you're maybe you're part of a care association or a wider group, it's sharing knowledge to go and see what things work and what don't and having a look at how people are getting best practice in place. Then you can adapt your strategies. So really you to monitoring these things, you need like a comprehensive approach that's integrating the technology, your assessment, engagement and alignment with your ESG policy. Great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, can you give examples of uh, an internal energy reduction policy? Yeah, I just give an example of something you could do. For um, let's, let's say we've got a care home. We want to enhance your environmental sustainability and improve your energy efficiency. Um, your policy is going to support your ESG commitments and you want to minimize your carbon footprint. So let's say you have some objectives. First of all, you could have I want to reduce energy consumption. I want to achieve, say, a 20% reduction in energy use over the next five years. 
to combine this with decreasing your carbon emissions. Let's say I want to lower my carbon emissions by 30% and implementing energy efficient practices and using renewable energy sources. Alongside that, I want to enhance my resident comfort. I want to improve the indoor environmental quality whilst maintaining a comfortable living space. So there's your objectives. Your next set is your action plan. So an ex- a sample exa- action plan would be having energy audits and assessments. You're going to conduct an initial energy audit to identify your current usage patterns and, and where you want to improve. Then you set up your regular audits, say annually, to monitor that progress and then recalibrate what your strategies are. Number two may be to look and upgrade your infrastructure. Let's say we're going to replace all existing lighting with LED fixtures to reduce energy consumption. We're going to upgrade our systems to energy efficient models and implement smart thermostats, for example, to optimize heating and cooling. Our next one would be maybe to look at what our renewable energy solutions are. So whilst this would be a large cost, we're looking at an ideal policy. We're going to install some solar panels on the roof and generate renewable energy, aiming for, say, 25% energy consumption from solar within three years. But then to do that, if we've got limited funds, we're going to explore partnerships with local renewable energy providers to source this green energy. Because as I've talked about in a previous podcast, sometimes they have a fund where they will put something in place, you'll put a lease in place, they will buy back the excess energy and actually it can reduce costs of putting it in. Um, Next step on your action plan would be your behavioral change initiatives. So this is where we have our staff training programs focused on energy conservation practices, such as turning off equipment when not in use, closing doors, closing windows. Then we have a resident engagement program to encourage energy saver habits among the residents, such as using natural light and minimizing appliance use. Our next one would be waste management recycling. So a comprehensive recycling program and maybe, I don't know, a composting system for organic waste in the kitchen, something in place there. I mean, that obviously leads on to something nicely. Let's say you did have insufficient green space, you've got a composting system, grow your own vegetables outside. Something also benefit for the, for the residents. Uh, final one would be your monitoring and reporting. So that's where you're utilizing energy manager software to track your energy consumption in real time so you can see the trends. And then you're going to produce your quarterly reports detailing this energy usage and your carbon emissions and your progress against those goals. Uh, The two other things that come along with it would be your governance and accountability. So you'd probably want to set up something like a sustainability committee comprising staff, residents and community members to oversee the implementation of the energy reduction policy and assure your alignment with your ESG objectives. And then stakeholder engagement would be to regularly communicate your progress to your stakeholders, which is your residents, the families, the staff, to make sure everyone's on board. We can also look finally at our social impact, which is where we're providing training opportunities for staff in energy management and sustainability practices, and then engaging with the community, with local organisations, and promote sustainability initiatives and to educate the community about energy conservation. I know that some care homes are doing this already at the moment. So uh, that's a few ideas for a policy. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, uh, and obviously there are costs that come with these kind of policies. What might they be? And it, to be honest, is that even the best way to measure policies like this? Yeah. So we're looking at a carbon reduction policy. Um, you've got your initial investment um, mm. through things like energy audits, conducting your energy assessments and your, your upgrades and then your retrofits got the ongoing operational cost um, with your maintenance and the training. Then you have your monitoring reporting, such as your data management systems and other things. And then you could have external consultation, those fees and your compliance costs. But I suppose the question is, is actually carbon reduction the best measure? So the benefits of carbon reduction is it's clear. It's carbon reduction is a quantifiable goal that's really easy to report. Um, it aligns with global standards. Everyone's talked about the net, the, par- the pathway to, to net zero. And we're also looking at a bit of a broader impact to reduce those emissions can lead to energy efficiency improvements and cost savings. Your problem with it is it's a really narrow focus. It just looks at carbon emissions and it can overlook other important aspects of sustainability, such as waste management, water use, social equity. Um, it can be difficult to measure as well. Um, you need very good data collection and analysis. And one of the major problems, which is less of an issue for smaller social care providers, but maybe for some larger, is the issue of greenwashing. So if you emphasize, say, your path to net zero without looking at a forward view of sustainability, it can be just superficial efforts that don't lead to actual meaningful change. And it's just another box that you've ticked rather than what your overall overall goal is. Rob and Carl, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Legal Thinking. If you would like to find out more about ESG in the health and social care sector uh, as part of this podcast series, uh, we're recording a bunch of different episodes about different issues within the sector. Um, Please visit rwkgoodman.com forward slash HSCESG podcast, all one word. Thank you very much for listening.